This is the story of the great war that Ricky Tiki Tavi fought single handed through the bathrooms of the bungalow in Snagoli in India. Dartsy the tailor bird helped him, and Chuchundra the muskrat, who never comes out in the middle of the floor but always creeps around by the wall, gave him advice. But Ricky did the real fighting. He was a mongoose, rather like a little cat in his fur and his tail, but quite weasel like in his head and his habits. His eyes and the end of his restless nose were pink. He could scratch himself anywhere he pleased with any leg, front or back, that he chose to use. He could fluff up his tail till it looked like a bottle brush, and his war cry as he scuttled through the long grass was <laughs> One day, a high summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother and carried him kicking and clucking down a roadside ditch. He found a little wisp of grass floating there and clung to it till he lost his senses. When he revived, he was lying in the hot sun on the middle of a garden path, very draggled indeed, and a small boy was saying, Yes, dead mongoose. Let's have a funeral. No. Let's take him in and dry him. Perhaps he isn't really dead. I think... I think he's breathing. Do you suppose he's... I don't think he's quite dead. He's just half choked with water. They took him into the house, so they wrapped him in cotton wool. There, that should warm him up. Poor little chap. And he opened his eyes and sneezed. <gasps> and the big man, who was an Englishman who had just moved into the bungalow, said, Now, don't frighten him, and we'll see what he'll do next. It is the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose because he is eaten from nose to tail in curiosity. The motto of all the mongoose family is run and find out, and Ricky Ticky was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton wool, decided it was no good to eat, ran all around the table, sat up and put his fur in order, scratched himself, and jumped on the small boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy. That's just his way of making friends. <laughs> tickling under my chin. Ricky Ticky looked down between the boy's collar and neck, snuffed at his ear, and climbed down to the floor where he sat rubbing his nose. <laughs> I suppose he's so tame because we've been kind to him. And this is a wild thing. All mongooses are like that. If Teddy doesn't try to pick him up by the tail or try to put him in a cage, he'll run in and out all day. Let's give him something to eat so he'll stay. They gave him a little piece of raw meat. Ricky Ticky liked it immensely, and when it was finished, he went out into the veranda, sat in the sunshine, and fluffed up his fur to make it dry the roots. Then he felt better. There are more things to learn about this house and yard than all my family could learn in all of their lives. I shall certainly stay and find out. He spent all that day roaming over the house. He nearly drowned himself in the bathtubs, put his nose into the ink on a writing table, and burnt it on the end of the big man's cigar, for he climbed up in the big man's lap to see how writing was done. At nightfall, he ran into Teddy's nursery to watch how kerosene lamps were lighted, and when Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too. But he was a restless companion, because he had to get up and attend to every noise all through the night and find out what made it. Teddy's mother and father came in, the last thing, to look at their boy. And Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like that. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing. Teddy's safe with that little beast and we had a bloodhound to watch him. If a snake came into the nursery right now. Oh, please don't. I don't want to think of anything so awful. Early in the morning, Ricky Ticky came to early breakfast in the veranda, riding on Teddy's shoulder. And they gave him banana and some boiled egg. And he sat on all their laps, one after the other, because every well-brought-up mongoose always hopes to be a house mongoose someday and have rooms to run about in. And Ricky Ticky's mother, who used to live in the general's house at Sigoli, had carefully told Ricky what to do if ever he came across white men. Then Ricky Ticky went out into the garden to see what was to be seen. It was a large garden, only half cultivated, with bushes as big as summer houses of Marshall Neal roses, lime and orange trees, clumps of bamboos, and thickets of high grass. Ricky Ticky licked his lips. This is a splendid hunting ground. And his tail grew bottle brushy at the thought of it. 
and he scuttled up and down the garden, snuffing here and there till he heard very sorrowful voices in a thorn bush. It was Dartsy, the tailor bird, and his wife. They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together and stitching them up the edges with fibers, and had filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The nest swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. What's the matter? We are very miserable. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday, and Nag ate him. Hmm, that is very sad. But I'm a stranger. Who's Nag? Dartsy and his wife only cowered down in the nest without answering. For from the thick grass at the foot of the bush there came a low hiss, a horrid cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back two clear feet. Then, inch by inch, out of the grass rose up the head and spread hood of Nag, the big black cobra, and he was five feet long from tongue to tail. When he had lifted one-third of himself clear of the ground, he stayed balancing to and fro exactly as a dandelion tuft balances in the wind, and he looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake's eyes that never change their expression, whatever the snake may be thinking of. The great god Brum put his mark upon all our people when the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off Brum. Look and be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever, and Ricky Ticky saw the spectacle mark on the back of it that looks exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for the minute but it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time. And though Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones, and he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Nag knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Well, marks or no marks, do you think it is right for you to eat fledglings out of a nest? Nag was thinking to himself, and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Ricky Ticky. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family, but he wanted to get Ricky Ticky off his guard, so he dropped his head a little and put it on one side. Let us talk, you eat eggs. Why should I not eat birds? Behind you, Nag's wife, look behind you! Ricky Ticky knew better than to waste time in staring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could go, and just under him whizzed by the head of Nagaina, Nag's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him, and he heard her savage hiss as the stroke missed. He came down almost across her back, and if he had been an old mongoose, he would have known that then was the time to break her back with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible lashing return stroke of the cobra. He bit, indeed but did not bite long enough, and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving Nagaina torn and angry. Wicked, wicked bird! Nagaina lashed up as high as she could reach toward the nest in the thorn bush, but Dartsy had built it out of reach of snakes, and it only swayed to and fro. Ricky Ticky felt his eyes growing red and hot, and when a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry and he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a little kangaroo and looked all around him and shattered with rage. But Nag and Nagaina had disappeared into the grass. When a snake misses its stroke, it never says anything or gives any sign of what it means to do next. Ricky Ticky did not care to follow them, for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once, so he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. If you read the old books of natural history, you will find they say that when the mongoose fights the snake and happens to get bitten, he runs off and eats some herb that cures him. That is not true. The victory is only a matter of quickness of eye and quickness of foot. Snakes blow against mongoose's jump, and as no eye can follow the motion of a snake's head when it strikes, that makes things much more wonderful than any magic herb. Ricky Ticky knew he was a young mongoose, and it made him all the more pleased to think that he had managed to escape a blow from behind. 
gave him confidence in himself, and when Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Ticky was ready to be petted. Ricky, where have you been? I bet you've been playing. But just as Teddy was stooping, something flinched a little in the dust. Be careful. I am death. It was Karate, the dusty brown snakeling that lies for choice on the dusty earth. And his bite is as dangerous as the cobra's. But he is so small that nobody thinks of him. And so he does the more harm to people. Ricky Ticky's eyes grew red again, and he danced. That bite paralyzed Karait, and Ricky Ticky was just going to eat him up from the tail after the custom of his family at dinner, when he remembered that a full meal makes a slow mongoose, and if he wanted all his strength and quickness ready, he must keep himself thin. You just saved your life, Teddy. Ricky went away for a dust bath under the castor oil bushes, while Teddy's father beat the dead Karait. What is the use of that? I have settled it all. And then Teddy's mother picked him up from the dust and hugged him, crying that he had saved Teddy from death. And Teddy's father said that he was a providence. And Teddy looked on with big, scared eyes. Ricky Ticky was rather amused at all the fuss, which, of course, he did not understand. Teddy's mother might just as well have petted Teddy for playing in the dust. Ricky was thoroughly enjoying himself. That night, at dinner, walking to and fro among the wine glasses on the table, he could have stuffed himself three times over with nice things. But he remembered Nag and Nagaina, and though it was very pleasant to be patted and petted by Teddy's mother and to sit on Teddy's shoulder, his eyes would get red from time to time, and he would go off into his long war cry. <laughs> Teddy carried him off to bed, and insisted on Ricky Ticky sleeping under his chin. Ricky Ticky was too well bred to bite or scratch, but as soon as Teddy was asleep, he went off for his nightly walk round the house, and in the dark, he ran up against Chuchundra the muskrat, creeping round by the wall. Chuchundra is a broken hearted little beast. He whimpers and cheeps all the night, trying to make up his mind to run into the middle of the room. But he never gets there. Don't kill me, great mongoose. Don't kill me. <laughs> Do you think a snake killer kills muskrats? Those who kill snakes get killed by snakes. How am I to be sure that Nag won't mistake me for you some dark night? There's not the least danger. Nag is out in the garden, and I know you don't go there. My cousin, Chua the rat, told me... Told you what, Chuchandra? <laughs> Nag is everywhere. Oh dear, oh dear. You should have talked to Chua. Well, I didn't, so you must tell me quick. Quick, Chuchandra, or I shall bite you. I'm a very poor and humble man. I never have spirit to go out into the middle of the room. I mustn't tell you anything. Can't you hear, Ricky Ticky? Ricky Ticky listened. The house was as still as still. 
but he thought he could just catch the faintest scratch, scratch in the world, a noise as faint as that of a wasp walking on a window pane, the dry scratch of a snake's scales on brickwork. That's Nag, or Nagaina, and it sounds like he's crawling into the bathroom sluice. You are right, Chachandra. I should have spoken to Chua. He stole off to Teddy's bathroom, but there was nothing there, and then to Teddy's mother's bathroom. At the bottom of the smooth plaster wall there was a brick pulled out to make a sluice for the bath water, and as Ricky Ticky stole in by the masonry curb where the bath is put, he heard Nag and Nagaina whispering together outside in the moonlight. I will go, and I will kill the big man and his wife and the child. If I can, then the bungalow will be empty, and Ricky Ticky will go. Shh. When the house is empty of people, the mongoose will. Ricky-ticky tingled all over with rage and hatred at this. And then Nag's head came through the sluice, and his five feet of cold body followed it. Angry as he was, Ricky-ticky was very frightened as he saw the size of the big cobra. Nag coiled himself up, raised his head, and looked into the bathroom in the dark. And Ricky could see his eyes glitter. Mm. If I kill him here, Nagaina will know. If I fight him on the open floor, the odds are in his favor. What am I to do? Nag waved to and fro, and then Ricky Tiki heard him drinking from the biggest water jar that was used to fill the bath. This is good. Nag coiled himself down, coil by coil, round the bulge at the bottom of the water jar, and Ricky Ticky stayed still as death. After an hour, he began to move, muscle by muscle, toward the jar. Nag was asleep, and Ricky Ticky looked at his big back, wondering which would be the best place for a good hole. If I don't break his back at the first jump, he can still fight. And if he fights, oh, Ricky. He looked at the thickness of the neck below the hood, but that was too much for him. And a bite near the tail would only make Nag savage. It must be the head, the head above the hood. And once I'm there, I must never let go. Then he jumped. The head was lying a little clear of the water jar, under the curve of it. And as his teeth met, Ricky braced his back against the bulge of the red earthenware to hold down the head. This gave him just one second's purchase, and he made the most of it. Then he was battered to and fro as a rat is shaken by a dog. To and fro on the floor, up and down, and round in great circles. But his eyes were red, and he held on as the body cart whipped over the floor, upsetting the tin dipper and the soap dish and the flesh brush, and banged against the tin side of the bath. As he held, he closed his jaws tighter and tighter, for he made sure he would be banged to death, and for the honor of his family, he preferred to be found with his teeth locked. He was dizzy, aching, and felt shaken to pieces when something went off like a thunderclap just behind him. A hot wind knocked him senseless, and red fire singed his fur. The big man had been wakened by the noise, and had fired both barrels of a shotgun into Nag just behind the hood. 
Ricky Ticky held on with his eyes shut, for now he was quite sure he was dead. But the head did not move, and the big man picked him up. It's the mongoose again. The little chap has saved our lives now. Then Teddy's mother came in with a very white face and saw what was left of Nag, and Ricky Ticky dragged himself to Teddy's bedroom and spent half the rest of the night shaking himself tenderly to find out whether he was really broken into forty pieces, as he fancied. When morning came, he was very stiff, but well pleased with his doings. Now I have Nagaina to settle with, and she'll be worse than five nags, and there's no telling when her eggs will hatch. Without waiting for breakfast, Ricky Ticky ran to the thorn bush where Dodsey was singing a song of triumph at the top of his voice. The news of Nag's death was all over the garden, for the sweeper had thrown the body on the rubbish heap. Who has delivered us? Who? Tell me his nest and his name. Ricky the valiant, the true. Ticky with eyeballs of flame. Rick Ticky Ticky the Ivory Fang, the hunter with eyeballs of flame. You stupid tough of feathers, is this the time to sing? Where's Nagaina? Sing to your fledglings again. Mother, oh, lift up your head. Evil that plagued us is slain. Death in the garden lies dead. Terror that hid in the roses is gone. He lies on the rubbish heap dead. Stop! Stop it, Darcy! Where's Nagaina? For the great, the beautiful Ricky's sake, I will stop. What is it, O'Killer of the Terrible Nag? Where's Nagaina for the third time? Nagaina came to the bathroom sluice to call for Nag, and Nag came out on the end of a stick. The sweeper picked him up on the stick and threw him upon the rubbish heap. Let us think about the great, the red-eyed Ricky Ticky! Oh, if I could get up to your nest, I'd roll all of your babies out. You don't know when to do the right thing at the right time. You're safe enough in your nest up there, but it's war for me down here. Stop singing for a minute, Darcy! Great is Ricky Ticky with the white teeth! Bother my white teeth! Where does she keep her eggs? Give him the thanks of the birds! Bowing with tail feathers spread! Praise him with nightingale words! Nay, I will praise him instead! Here I will sing you the praise of the bottle-tailed Ricky with eyeballs of red! Darcy was a feather-brained little fellow who could never hold more than one idea at a time in his head. And just because he knew that Nagaina's children were born in eggs like his own, he didn't think at first that it was fair to kill them. But his wife was a sensible bird, and she knew that cobra's eggs meant young cobras later on. In the melon bed, on the end nearest the wall. Quickly, fly off and pretend your wing is broken and let Nagaina chase you back here. I must get to the melon bed. Dotsy's wife.
Ricky Ticky heard them going up the path from the stables, and he raced for the end of the melon patch near the wall. There, in the warm litter about the melons, very cunningly hidden, he found twenty-five eggs, about the size of a bantam's eggs, but with whitish skin instead of shell. I wasn't a day too soon. He could see the baby cobras curled up inside the skin, and he knew that the minute they were hatched they could each kill a man or a mongoose. He bit off the tops of the eggs as fast as he could, taking care to crush the young cobras, and turned over the litter from time to time to see whether he had missed any. At last there were only three eggs left, and Ricky Ticky began to chuckle to himself when he heard Dotsy's wife. Ricky Ticky, I led Naga Ina toward the house, and she has gone into the veranda. Oh, come quickly! She means killing! Ricky Ticky smashed two eggs and tumbled backward down the melon bed with the third egg in his mouth and scuttled to the veranda as hard as he could put foot to the ground. Teddy and his mother and father were there at early breakfast. singing a song of triumph. Son of the man that killed Nog, stay still. I am not ready yet. Wait a little. Keep very still, all you three. If you move, I strike. And if you do not move, I strike. Sit still, Teddy. You mustn't move, Teddy. Teddy, keep still. Then Ricky Ticky came up. Turn around, Nagaina. Turn and fight. All in good time. I will settle my account with you presently. Look at your friends, Ricky Ticky. They are still. Strike. Look at your eggs in the melon bed. Go and look, Nagaina. The big snake turned half round and saw the egg on the veranda. <sighs> Give it to me. What price for a snake's egg? For a young cobra? For a young king cobra? For the last, the very last of the brood? The ants are eating all the others down by the melon bed. Nagaina spun clear round forgetting everything for the sake of the one egg. And Ricky Ticky saw Teddy's father shoot out a big hand, catch Teddy by the shoulder, and drag him across the little table with the teacups, safe and out of reach of Nagaina. Tricked, 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 Rick. The boy is safe, and it was I, I, I that caught Nog by the hood last night in the bathroom. He threw me to and fro, but he could not shake me off. He was dead before the big man blew him up. I killed Nog! Come and fight with me, Nagaina. You shall not be a widow long. Nagaina saw that she had lost her chance of killing Teddy, and the egg lay between Ricky Ticky's paws. She lowered her hood and said, Give me the egg, Ricky Ticky. Give me the last of my eggs, and I will go away and never come back. Yes, you will go away, and you will never come back, for you will go to the rubbish heap with Nog. Fight, widow. The big man is gone for his gun. Fight! Ricky Ticky was bounding all round Nagaina, keeping just out of reach of her stroke, his little eyes like hot coals. Nagaina gathered herself together and flung out at him. Ricky Ticky jumped up and backward. Again and again and again she struck and each time her head came with a whack on the matting of the veranda, and she gathered herself together like a watch spring. Then Ricky Ticky danced in a circle to get behind her, and Nagaina spun round to keep her head to his head, 
so that the rustle of her tail on the matting sounded like dry leaves blown along by the wind. He had forgotten the egg. It still lay on the veranda, and Nagaina came nearer and nearer to it, till at last, while Ricky Tikki was drawing breath, she caught it in her mouth, turned to the veranda steps, and flew like an arrow down the path with Ricky Tikki behind her. When the cobra runs for her life, she goes like a whiplash flicked across a horse's neck. Ricky Tikki knew that he must catch her, or all the trouble would begin again. She headed straight for the long grass by the thorn bush, and as he was running, Ricky Tikki heard Dartsy still singing his foolish little song of triumph. But Dartsy's wife was wiser. She flew off her nest as Nagaina came along and flapped her wings about Nagaina's head. If Dartsy had helped, they might have turned her. But Nagaina only lowered her hood and went on. Still, the instant's delay brought Ricky Tikki up to her. And as she plunged into the rat hole where she and Nag used to live, his little white teeth were clenched on her tail, and he went down with her. And very few mongooses, however wise and old they may be, care to follow a cobra into its hole. It was dark in the hole, and Ricky Tikki never knew when it might open out and give Nagaina room to turn and strike at him. He held on savagely and struck out his feet to act as brakes on the dark slope of the hot, moist earth. Then the grass by the mouth of the hole stopped waving, and Dotsy said, It's all over for Ricky Ticky. We must sing his death song. Sing him the sad song of birds, bowing with tail for the spread. Sing your fledglings again, mother will put down your head. Nagaina will hunt in the garden once more, for Ricky the Valiant is dead. Just as he got to the most touching part, the grass quivered again, and Ricky Ticky covered with dirt, dragged himself out of the hole, leg by leg, licking his whiskers. Darcy stopped with a little shout. Ricky Ticky shook some of the dust out of his fur. <coughs> it's all over. Nagaina will never come out again. And the red ants that lived between the grass stems heard him, and began to troop down one after another to see if he had spoken the truth. Ricky Ticky curled himself up in the grass and slept where he was. Slept and slept till it was late in the afternoon, for he had done a hard day's work. When he awoke... <sighs> now I'll go back to the house. Tell the garden, Darcy. Tell them that Nagaina is dead. And Ricky returned for the house, hearing that Darcy did as requested singing a song of great victory. Who has delivered us? Who? Tell me his nest and his name. Ricky the Valiant, the true. Ticky with eyeballs aflame. Rick Ticky Ticky, the ivory fang, the hunter with eyeballs aflame. Before long, his song was joined by the other birds and the croaks of frogs. For Nag and Nagaina had fed on frogs as well. When Ricky got to the house, Teddy and Teddy's mother, and she still looked very white, for she had been fainting, and Teddy's father came out and almost cried over him. And that night he ate all that was given him till he could eat no more, and went to bed on Teddy's shoulder, where Teddy's mother saw him when she came to look late at night. He saved our lives, and Teddy's life. Just think. He saved all our lives. Ricky Ticky woke up with a jump, for all the mongooses are light sleepers. Oh, it's you. What are you bothering for? All the cobras are dead, and if they weren't, I'm here. Ricky Ticky had a right to be proud of himself, but he did not grow too proud, and he kept that garden as a mongoose should keep it, with tooth and jump and spring and bite. Till never a cobra dared show its head inside the walls ever again. <laughs>